Hello, my name is Mary Ann D'Souza. I'm director of the New Bedford Health Department. And this, today we are gathered to discuss concerns regarding mosquito-borne viruses which may infect people within our community. This is a serious concern, especially in the city of New Bedford where the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has found that we are at high risk for mosquito-borne illnesses. We will be presenting information that will be very valuable to you and your families today to help protect you from the, the risk that is in our community. This, uh, today I'd also like to welcome Dr. Patricia Andrade, who is a member of the New Bedford Board of Health, who would like to have a few words. And as soon as she's spoken, we will be welcoming representatives from the Bristol County Mosquito Control Project, Priscilla Matten, and also Wayne Andrews, who will be providing some expert advice on how we can best protect ourselves in our community. I would like to welcome the um, everyone who's here to listen to this information session and the uh, folks from the state. Um, this is a, an ongoing problem. The mosquito-borne illnesses have been ongoing in our community over the last few years and it's not something that's going to go away, but it's um, necessary to educate and inform the public and that's what we hope that will happen this evening. So I'll turn it back over to Mary Ann for our introductions. Thank you. I'd like to act th this time present Priscilla Matten, who will be speaking uh, and present reviewing the slides that we have today. Thank you, and I'm delighted to be here this evening and talk to all the residents of New Bedford and the surrounding areas. Today we are going to talk about the Bristol County Mosquito Control and some of the mosquito control measures that we do here in New Bedford and some of the risks that we have seen. Uh, Wayne Andrews is also here. He's the superintendent, and he will be able to answer any questions that anybody has. So some of the facts about mosquitoes in Massachusetts. Most people probably don't know that there are 51 different types of mosquitoes right here in our own state. Not all of them are that important. Not all of them we pay too much attention to. Only the female mosquito takes a blood meal, and not even all mosquitoes take blood meals. And not all mosquitoes bite on people. Some bite on birds, some bite amphibians, some bite a whole different types of animals and sometimes they bo bite both birds and mammals. So when we talk about mosquito species, you know, there's a lot of things that go into it. We also want to talk a little bit about overwintering. We know that everybody says once the first hard frost comes that there will be no more mosquitoes. Well, that's not necessarily true. Mosquitoes need to overwinter. Think of it as hibernation. Some of them are going to hibernate or overwinter in the adult stage, some of them in the egg stage, and some of them in the larval stages. And these are all things that we need to take into consideration when we're dealing with viruses here in Massachusetts. So what is the life cycle of the mosquito? First we start with the egg stage. Some eggs are laid directly on water, some have to be dried down first and then they hatch. The ones that can be dried down, they can last for years in the environment. This is something that we look for, especially in flood water situations, like along the sides of your roads or in ditches. Because then you get the larval stage. The larval stage has to live in water. They usually live in water that's only up to about 16 to 18 inches deep because mosquitoes breathe air. So they need to get all the way to the bottom of the bucket or the pool or whatever water system that they're in to catch food or eat food and then get all the way back up to the top in order to breathe air. Then we have the pupal stage. This stage is when they metamorphose into the adult mosquito, the ones that we find on the wing that sometimes are biting us. So what do we do? We now know that there are a variety of different types of mosquitoes. They're in a variety of different type of water habitats. So what we do at Bristol County Mosquito Control is we use traps. And these are our monitoring tools so that we can find out what mosquitoes are in the environment and if they have any viruses that might impact you and your family. So there's a wide variety of traps that we use and the traps are different depending on what we're looking for. Are we looking for West Nile virus or are we looking for EEE or Triple E, also known as equine encephalitis. So we use all of these traps throughout Bristol County as well as in New Bedford and the surrounding areas. So what, what are we talking about? What got us here? Why are we here tonight? Well, 
West Nile virus was found right here in New Bedford, and it was found in a mosquito that is commonly called the northern house mosquito. Scientific name is Culex pipiens. But the northern house mosquito is pretty interesting because it feeds about 90% of the time on birds and about 10% of the time on mammals. That 10% of the time is what we're concerned about because it has the potential to then transmit possibly West Nile virus back to you. Well, what about Tripoli? We've heard a lot about eastern equine encephalitis this year, especially in New Bedford. So we have one mosquito, which is Culicida melanora, which is a bird feeder. And it's a bird feeder most of the time. And what we found is that every once in a while, we'll get what we call an opportunistic feeder, one that's not quite so picky, and will feed on both birds and mammals. And that's where we got the canadensis, or Ocleritatis canadensis mosquito, which is 90% mammal and about 10 percent bird and this became very important because we found it in traps right in the industrial park. So what we have now is we have a timeline that was developed. So we found our first mammal biting mosquito for Tripoli on September 16th followed by a horse case not very far away in Freetown on September 22nd and then another canadensis here in New Bedford again on September 30th. So we can see the possibility is that we had some sort of idea that there were concerns out there from mammal interaction to these diseases. We received have a horse case and then we had more human biters. This is why the Department of Public Health and the local boards of health have been so interested in providing information to the residents about concerns because we know that there is some mammal activity out there. So this is a very busy slide but I'd like to point out some things to everybody. The blue areas are water and you can see that the New Bedford area is down in that area and we have all the towns that are surrounding it. The red hashed areas seen here are areas that are considered priority habitat or habitat that's important to endangered or rare species. So what we have is we have these green stars which represent two trap locations. One of the trap locations here is right in the industrial park. One of them is just outside in the Freetown area. And that black triangle way up top in Freetown was the horse case. So as you can see though it may look like everything is quite spread out, when you move on further we're able to see that they're all in a straight line and that they're all within flight distance of a mosquito. So this bed, big red circle here is actually a five mile radius from the trap located right here in New Bedford. So it's five miles out. The average mosquito can easily fly five miles in a day. So all of these positives mosquitoes are all found well within you know a small area and it even goes all the way down into greater New Bedford as well, not just the northern New Bedford section. So sometimes it's hard to understand that mosquitoes fly so far or, oh, you know, that horse case happened in Freetown, therefore it's not going to affect me because I live in New Bedford. Or it doesn't matter if it happens in a cushionage or somewhere else. But mosquitoes fly miles very easily. And it's very important that we take that into consideration because when it happens in our community, it's happening also around us. And mosquitoes fly miles, they don't care about town boundaries or anything else, they will continue to fly until they find either the water source that they need to lay their eggs or until they find a host or a place that they, they want to inhabit. So it's important to keep into consideration that when dealing with arboviruses or mosquito-borne illnesses that it, it transects all different counties and expands all over. So where are we now? We're going into the winter and we have what the Massachusetts Department of Health has produced as the West Nile virus risk. And as you can see, all of Bristol County and up into the Boston area are in a high risk. That is our level right now for West Nile virus. This is important because those Culex pipiens mosquitoes, that northern house mosquito that I mentioned that was found here in New Bedford, does overwinter as the adult stage. That means that there will be overwintering adults with West Nile virus here in the city as well as in the surrounding areas. So it's something that we need to be aware of when next year comes around. And down here we have the current risk level for Tripoli. And as you can see, it's just the areas around New Bedford and Acushnet, uh, Freetown and Berkeley are the areas that have, um, have the highest risk level for Tripoli. And then the surrounding areas because remember, 
mosquitoes will pass over borders. So we need to make sure we keep an eye on the whole area. So we're going to go through the Tripoli cycle a little bit. Slightly confusing, but we'll try to explain it the best that we can. Basically, you get this amplification cycle. This happens every year. We have a bird and a mosquito. Normally, for Tripoli, it's the Culicina melanora mosquito. And this mosquito and bird interaction happens every year, happens in the swamps and in the areas uh, around New Bedford and throughout the county. As this continues to happen, birds will pick it up and then there will be other mosquitoes that become involved. These other mosquitoes are what we term bridge vectors. What they do is they're not quite so picky. They're They'll feed on a bird as well as on other things. They can pick up the virus from feeding on a bird and then what ends up happening is they pass it on to the incidental host, which can be the humans or horses. Because of this incidental host, they're dead end vectors, or excuse me, they're dead end hosts, which means that they're not able to pass on the virus to another mosquito, but they are able to have effects from Tripoli and West Nile. And that's why it's important that your horses be vaccinated from Tripoli. And you should talk to your vets if you have any horses or questions. What we're looking into now is to figure out what kind of uh, effect does Melanora have on this other sort of state? Do they feed on horses and humans are able to pass on the virus directly? Or are they just important in the main amplification? So then we have West Nile virus. Very, very similar. The difference is the mosquitoes that are involved and the birds that are involved. And as we probably remember when West Nile came here, we started to lose the crows and the blue jays and people weren't seeing them as frequently. It's because unfortunately West Nile virus was killing those types of birds. So what we have is the same cycle. We have a bird reservoir with a mosquito. This time it's the common house mosquito, the northern house mosquito. And then it goes and you still have your potential bridge vectors that go back into the humans and horses. And again, you can have your horses vaccinated for West Nile virus and should talk to your vet about that. So what I want to get out of this is prevention. Prevention at this point is very important. Temperatures are down, um, our applications of pesticides are becoming less and less effective, and we're getting less time in order to make those things happen. So I'd like everybody to remember the five Ds of prevention. We got dusk, dawn, dress, deet, and drain. So what does that mean? Dusk and dawn, try to avoid outdoor activities during dusk and dawn. This is when most of the mosquitoes will be taking a blood meal. Sure, you can go out in the middle of the day and you'll find mosquitoes, but they're most frequent during those times of the day. <clears throat> Remember, as fall approaches and the days get shorter and get cooler, even though dusk may not be until technically 6 o'clock according to the newspaper, the mosquitoes are going to start coming out around 4 o'clock or 4.30, 5 o'clock, even 3.30 once we get a little further on. This is important because this is when most of your kids are coming home from school or going out and playing in that football game or playing some sport or a band activity. This is when you want to watch for the kids. So you want to try to make them dress. Dress means wear long sleeves and long pants and um, try to cover up as much as you can when you have to be outside. Use repellents and follow the labels. DEET is important. Also, the Center for Disease Control recommends picaridin as an option if D is not one of your favorites. Or an oil of lemon eucalyptus is also an option. And permethrin is great for ticks as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about pyrethrin in a few minutes. But remember to use repellent. This is very, very important when you're outside. Even if you're going to be covered in, in full dress, you know, wear a little bit of DEET on the back of your neck or on your hands or on your face if necessary if you're going to be in areas where there's a lot of mosquitoes. Always read the label and if you have any questions or concerns about applying it to you or your family members, remember to talk to your doctor. And drain. Remove any standing water around your property. This would be things like cleaning out your gutters, um, removing any tires you may have around your property, old buckets, um, you know, pools that you had for maybe the dog or your kiddie pools that you just forgot about and we're just going to leave. Those places are areas where mosquitoes will breed right in your backyard and you can help to do something to reduce your risk of being bitten by one of those mosquitoes. So we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to talk about ticks. So t deer ticks 
which I have a picture of an engorged female deer tick. Deer ticks are the ones that transmit Lyme disease, and this is really important. And what we want to do is you want to avoid tick habitat during these peak times of the year, which is generally mid-May through mid-September. But we also know that ticks have two-year life cycles. And we want to know that ticks are found in mostly brushy and wooded areas. But where you're going to find ticks most likely is around your house, um, in the areas right between where your woods start and then your grasses. Or say you're like most of us and you rake the leaves up in the, in the fall and let the kids jump in them. That's a great place for ticks to hide because the mice that carry the ticks like to run through the leaves and they can drop ticks off in the area and then your kids are playing in it and then they get it. Not saying that you shouldn't allow your kids to play in the leaves, but let's take some precaution. Again, you're going to be out at the same time like you are right now. You're going to want to wear long sleeves and long pants. You're going to want to check the kids for ticks. You know, make sure you check their hair and the back of their ears and all over their body to make sure that they have no ticks on them. You can also use the um, pyrethrin, which is not sprayed directly on the body, but actually on the clothes, which is great if your kids have outdoor shoes. Spray the shoes, and then the spray stays on for about two weeks, especially since shoes are not usually washed. Or you could spray a jacket or something that they only use for this activity. You just want to make sure that you follow the label. So say you don't spray and you have your ticks and uh, the kids go out to play and you're concerned. When you bring the kids in, don't throw the clothes directly in the hamper. Take the clothes out, throw it in the dryer. Put it in the dryer for about 10, 15 minutes on hot and you'll end up killing the ticks and knocking them off. And then they won't be in your hamper where they can get off your clothes and move on to somebody else's. Check your dogs and make sure that they don't have ticks and they're not bringing them into the house as well as your cats. So when we talk about ticks, we have to remember that deer ticks have a two-year life cycle. So they start out as eggs in the spring, and they hatch the larval stages. In the larval stage, they will start to feed on things like the white-footed mouse, which is the reason why the ticks end up with Lyme disease. Then as they go through the summer, they go into the nymphal stage. And in the nymphal stage in the fall, they will become dormant. They'll go through the winter in that stage, and in the spring, the nymphal stage will have to take another blood meal in order to become an adult. And it's in that stage, in the nymphal stage, that they're going to be feeding on you and me and your dog, as well as another opportunity them to pick up uh, Lyme disease if they didn't the first time they fed. So this is a very important time when the summer and spring areas and in, into the fall, once they change over into the adult stage. Now the adults need to take a blood meal in order so that the female can lay the egg. So the female tick will take a blood meal. She can then either pass on the Lyme disease or get Lyme disease and then she'll lay her eggs in the spring. So it's actually a two-year life cycle. So at different times of the year, you'll have nymphal and adult ticks present at the same time. And it's really important for people to watch this and pay attention to what's going on and make sure that you check your kids and yourself when you're out in these areas. So I'm just going to conclude with some general information about us, where we're found in Taunton, our address and our phone number. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email us. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, we'd be happy to answer any questions from anybody here. And uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Hi, Priscilla Matten from the Bristol County Mosquito Control. I'm here with Wayne Andrews, the superintendent, to answer some more of your questions. Residents in the area of New Bedford can call into the office during regular mosquito season, which is usually from the end of May into September, to request that their area be sprayed for mosquitoes. The number to the office is 508-823-5253. Five, three. We would ask some general information like your last name, your address, and where you live in New Bedford, and we will go to your area and have it sprayed. If you can get your neighbors to call in or send a fax, then that's even better because the more area that we can cover, the better off that we are. Also, in early spring, we take requests for standing water for larviciding purposes in the area. So if you have any standing water that you may be concerned of, you can call our office. We'll go out there and check it to see if there's any larvae present and if so, we can apply a pesticide to kill them before they're on the wing and biting you. 
Also, a precaution that we'd like to have taken now that we're in the fall season and the mosquitoes are still out despite the cold temperatures. When you're at these activities such as football games uh, or other sporting events in the evening, whether you're in New Bedford or anywhere around the Commonwealth, we want you to make sure that you take precaution. It's not so much the kids that are on the field that are of a concern because they're running around, usually they're covered up in some sort of uh, uniform, but it's the kids that are on the edge. It's your sister, your brother or your neighbors that may be playing on the swing set or walking in the woods or hanging around the edge of the field or the ones that are just sitting in the stands waiting as the game goes on. Those are the people that we get concerned about as well and those are the people that need to take precautions like wearing the long sleeves and long pants and uh, using DEET and uh, trying to uh, protect yourself from mosquitoes. How long after spraying takes place? Is it safe for someone to go out? Sometimes we get calls with people having concerns either for their pets or outdoor activity. Um, when they spray an area, and I know it's ground spraying that you do, um, you know, what kind of, uh, how could you address that if you were talking to a parent that might be concerned about that issue? Uh, we'd appreciate a little information about that. Um, we know the material dissipates very quickly. It's a ULV type of application and it breaks down quickly when, when the sun comes out and additionally moves out of the area uh, very quickly. It doesn't tend to build up on, on things around the house and that. When it moves out, it moves out and it's a matter of 15 or 20 minutes uh, to stay inside if you choose. Many people don't. They leave the windows open and there's nothing in the label to prohibit that, but cautionary be, be good to shut your windows and usually you know when we're going to spray in an area. And it has an extremely low toxicity. That's why we choose it and use it in Massachusetts. It was also used by the Department of Public Health when they did the aerial applications in 2006 because of its great uh, safety record and, and, and res you know, residual and its ability to knock down mosquitoes quickly and break down fast and, and low impact on, on target um, and uh, non-targets and things like that. Basically what you're saying is, is that this is so low, low in terms of toxicity and in, it's very pretty much targeted to be effective towards mosquitoes. So that the concern that we have is really that we're focusing on protecting the public from the Triple E virus and the West Nile virus by controlling mosquitoes and the real risk is the mosquito from the mosquito bites. That's what we're really trying to prevent. Indeed. Um you know, part of what we do, our application is done at night, so we're targeting mosquitoes. Um, we want mosquitoes um, the, the best time of the night and, and, and to work at that time of the night when it works the best. Uh, the sunlight doesn't break it down, but when the sun comes out in the morning, there's a very quick breakdown of this product. It's very sensitive to UV light and such. So, you know, it's a good product for what we use it for here in Massachusetts, and all the mosquito controls in Massachusetts use this product for their adulticide applications. And again, it goes back to basic prevention, with, which Priscilla mentioned before. Do you want to go over those Ds one more time? Sure. Absolutely. The five Ds, dusk and dawn. You want to avoid activity outdoors during dusk and dawn from mosquitoes. Dress. Dress appropriately. Wear long sleeves and long pants, and that'll help you for Lyme disease and gathering ticks on yourself as well. DEET is a repellent that is approved by the CDC and we recommend. There are other listed mos uh, mosquito control repellents that you can use and permethrin also works against ticks as well as mosquitoes. And then you have the uh, drainage, drainage <laughs> which is to dump your areas around your house that may be holding water. Clean your gutters, check your tires, um, make sure you dump out any buckets or kiddie pools that you have standing around. Well, I think, again, I want to thank you for the valuable information that you've shared with us. I want to recommend to our viewers that they can get additional information through the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, as well as the City of New Bedford from our website. If you go to the website, we have our link uh, for, the board, for the Health Department and some valuable information on a variety of um, important issues uh, that are seasonal uh, regarding food safety, uh, mosquito control issues, um, you know, just many helpful hints that families should be aware of. So we encourage you to visit the city's website. We've worked hard to make that available to you. And at the end of this uh, program, there'll be a listing of the website so that you will know where to go to get more information. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>